All right. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Woo! Yeah, that's what I like to hear. We're going to get started here with our keynote. I've got the pleasure of introducing a longtime friend of ours, a friend of mine, the hacker with the perfect pitch. We've got Lance James launching us off today, so please give him a warm welcome to the stage. Boot. Good morning, everyone. Usually I have to do the whole like good evening, but you guys are pretty freaking cool. So maybe everybody like, wait, it's not evening. So um, I am okay. So I've just been. I'm gonna brag, but it's not about bragging. Uh, I've been speaking around the world, doing keynotes, everything like this. This is the first keynote I'm actually really nervous about, in a good way, because this is uh, this is a big thing. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, oh, you gotta press these buttons, I guess. Uh, I'm Lance James. Uh, currently, I am uh, the chief scientist over at Flashpoint. I also run a company like almost every other hacker does, too, just so that they can do pen tests and fun stuff. Uh, prior to that, I was head of cyber intelligence at Deloitte. I turned them around and made them from bean counters to actually understanding what cyber means. Cyber. Uh, and uh, I was also the original founder of I2P, which actually, in many ways, I'll explain, was inspired by TourCon. Um, and by the way, I know we have a bunch of parties, but if you guys sneak away from any of them and want to go karaoke tonight, I will not. I will go with you. I will go with you. Okay. So, um, this also, uh, they all like, you know, my company wants me to do biopics. So, I, I was like, all right, cool. Here's a lifelike drawing of me. Um, so, uh, you know, here we go. Um, I'm actually was thinking about this, and I wanted to, you know, like, I've been at TourCon almost since the beginning, and I'll go into that in a second. And I wanted to kind of brag and, like, do all the huge lists. And the only reason it wasn't about me, it was the fact that I could give a lot of credit to how many things we've done in this industry, how many things we've gone along in the last 19 years, uh, honestly, to TourCon uh, in that way. So it wasn't like, hey, look what I did. It was more like, look what inspired me. Like, like what did TourCon do for me? So anyways, I'm going to start with patient zero days, uh, which is 1990. Wait, wait, hold on. In a world. In 1999, before Skynet fell. All right, so basically what we have is a 15 or 16-year-old boy with his mom driving him everywhere around. I found that out today from Val over here. Uh, trying to basically start up this conference called TourCon. And root backwards, I think we all know that. So we have this guy, Ben. I don't know if I ever met Ben, but I'm going to give him credit because he seems like obviously cool and has a very cool like uh, pseudonym. Um, so Ben and uh, Scalor over here. Here's a very young... Picture of Hikari. I know it's we're jealous because I'm getting old and man does he look the same. So he's <laughs> bastards. So David was probably about 15 or 16 years old, probably on the cusp. When's your birthday? You're like when, when is your birthday? Yeah, okay. So you know he's probably planning it at 15, taking over the world by 16. Uh, uh, I actually uh, moved to San Diego in 1998 myself, right? Uh, and so I met them in about 2001. Now, let me tell you what was important about that. In 1998, I got moved here because someone actually heard me sing. Yes, that actually happened. Someone flew me on a plane, da da da. And I thought I was going to be doing music, right? And, uh, you know, there's two sides of it. When you grow up, you're like, I was a trained musician, all this stuff. And then, like, by eight, I was on a computer, too. And I couldn't, I was supposed to be practicing, but I was, I was having this hard time. This line, this fine line with me was getting on me. And what's really important is that when you become an adult as a hacker and someone who's like kind of like done that, and I'll, I'll tell you, I got in a little bit of skiffs when I was a teenager with this stuff, learning, learning the ropes and pissing people off. Um, but what was really important to me was the fact that I was trying to find a place to belong, and I didn't have anybody who understood my world yet. So to them, I was just this magician and scared the shit out of them, and they didn't understand that. I'm sure a lot of you have had that feeling when we were younger. And so I moved in late 1998, Worked through some stuff, had some fun, got some jobs, blah, blah, blah. And I'm living in this place called The Loft. It literally is called The Loft. Yes, it was a cult. I wasn't a part of it. I just basically was a sysadmin for basically living because I needed money and I needed a place to live. It was embarrassing. There was a guy named Mershid. He had this long beard. And man, when he ate, all his food was in his white beard. So <laughs> I think he's probably arrested by now. Anyways, <laughs> the point is I see these two guys. His name, one of them name is Tim and one of them name is David. And... Uh, Actually, I, for the longest time, probably thought your real name was Hikari, which was kind of cool, and I haven't really gotten over calling you that. So, uh, you know, I saw them looking around. The typewriter font's awesome for this kind of conference, by the way. I totally broke the Flashpoint rules of PR, like uh, type fonts, but who cares? Um, and I'm looking at it, and the reason why I know this answer right here, I'm like, okay, these guys are hackers. Or at least one of them was. Yeah, I don't know about Tim yet. He looked like the business guy. But... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so basically, and the reason why I knew this is because Har Hikari had his briefcase. One of these. <laughs> and this briefcase, the minute I saw it, I'm like, okay, there's either one of two things in there. Either this, because that's what I would have in there, <laughs> or something like this, which of course will scare the shit out of anybody that if you're walking near a military building. So, um, so I of course approached them because I am not exactly shy. You can tell, I think, not sure. And so we talked, and he was looking for a space, and we met him, and of course I think we hung out from there on, and like I was excited. And I'm, a, I'm probably this overwhelming like 18, 19 year old just running to these dudes that are really kind of introverted and quiet, and I'm like, ha ah, ha and it's like, mommy, right? That's, that's basically the feeling I had in my head, because I'm like, holy crap, I'm not by myself anymore. This is awesome, right? And you hear about 2600, and, and back then you hear about DEF CON, but that's still legendary and scary to someone like, that's not even like stepped into a community yet. Right, I'm not going to DEF CON or, or 2600, right? that's like stuff you add, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, what is that? That's like, uh, you know, then you find out 2600 is a bunch of 40 year olds living in their mom's basement still. But anyways, uh, <laughs> so, so basically, um, I kind of wanted to like look at it. So I, 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 by 2000, I think one, I came to TourCon, right? It was September, I believe we still had it back then. Uh, very different shifting time, I think September 11th just happened, uh, which was interesting, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, security, all that stuff, it kind of played into, like, obviously some of the climate that was already starting to shift, right? Um, but what, what TourCon to a young hacker like me was, when I walked in that room the first year, 2001 for me, was a safety net. First time I could feel, as humans, I think, and as especially importantly as hackers in a counterculture, we all want to feel accepted, validated, heard. You know, how many times we yell and say, you're stupid and vulnerable, blah, blah, blah. And it's not really about, we think they're stupid. We just want to be heard. We have some cool stuff we're working on. And the minute I walk in there, I find this safety net of people just like me. Most of them are a lot much quieter than I am. But, you know, still, I'm like, I, and, and actually, as much as I talked, I listened a lot. And it was really awesome, right? Another thing, it was my first start. It was to a young hacker, 19, 20 years old. It's a first start. It was like... And you know the cool thing is Hikari was introducing me as like a crypto expert. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm just starting to play around with it. But he respected the work I was doing and he introduced me to others. And, and that was a really cool thing is like I, I, you know, in my head, in your mind, your fear is like, oh my gosh, I, I'm probably not that smart. You know, the imposter syndrome we all have. And we're like, yeah, I'm probably just a fake. And they're, you know, all these hackers, this has got to be really, you know, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, you, what, a, what a joke. And, and we all have that feeling. I know we do. We have to humiliate ourselves at least once to get over it, right? But that's the feeling that I didn't get because someone like David came around and introduced me to people. And he, he would take a highlight of something I'm doing and he would introduce me to the highlight of something else they're doing. As if it was equal planes, you know? Um, and they became my friends. How many times have I had you in the house? Tim drunk as hell on a bed that, uh, on a sofa that my ex-wife doesn't really want anybody touching and that really, that was fun. Uh, big explanation there, sorry honey. It's cool. He's just really sick. But that's the, that's the that's the no touch sofa. Well, that's why I'm divorced. Anyways, so <laughs> yeah, not the life I wanted to live. But either way, friends, um, you know the cool thing is I got I got the privilege and honor to help with some of the workshop seminar build outs because I, I was running a business at the time later and I was you know getting pretty I was kind of hacking business. I was learning how that worked too, and so it was like really cool. So I I look back and I get to see like the success of like. Torcon's like a whole week now, practically, and it's really, really cool. And I see so many people learning and sharing information. But they were my friends, you know. Uh, they've been through that divorce I mentioned. They've been there, you know. Uh, it isn't just a community of, like, my technical skills, but, you know, you get to really have an underlying of who we are and, and how we're accepted. And through all of those things, they were there, too. Uh, and they were my community, right? They are, they are what I know kind of an extended family, like you all are in a way, even if I don't know you, like I can't wait to meet this guy with his head shaking like this, yeah, right? But I don't know him yet, but I know I'm gonna talk to him later, right? So, and that's the cool thing, we all share something and bond, like, you know, some people in church, they all share one belief, but we have something we share as a community, right? Um, and then it's my home, and today I feel back home, that's why I'm nervous, but I feel back home, and this is the biggest honor I could ever have. Um, so that, that's, that's to work on to a young hacker, and I, and I found a home, right? So 1999, 2001, the hacker climate. So 
Our favorite movies, I think most of these are right. I was guessing with most of the audience. I didn't get a time to do a survey. Did I miss any? Or was that kind of it? Which one? Wait. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay. Wait for it. That's our favorite movie to make fun of. That's different. Jeez. Okay, so we got war games, we got sneakers. I think we all love sneakers. It was kind of like, I want that job. And you know the funniest part is when they like give him, it's like a uh, paycheck, and then she's like, not a very good living. Because he goes, it's a living. And she goes, not a good living. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you talk now, huh? You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, real genius. How many people really loved real genius? So I was doing an interview for Mr. Robot. They had Jeff Moss on. They had a few different things. So the thing about like what hackers feel about Mr. Robot show. Secret, I didn't watch past five episodes. I had a friend tell me all the cool technical things and stuff. I just didn't have time. And two, I think like some of it's hard to get through, especially on the drug references. I was just like, all right, you know, get past two episodes of that. I got that. He does drugs. Good. Moving on. But basically, by the time I got there and stuff, and it was kind of funny, they were wanting the war games, best movie, right? And like I was going to go with the cliche. I'm like, nah, nah, real genius, man. That's like some prank ass shit, man. You know, like, you know, so, and it's kind of like the way the world is today. Right? It's like, look, you know, academics really secretly just doing stuff for the military. Hey, you know, so uh, real genius, you know, some votes at least. All right, cool. All right. You know, Val Kilmer, you know. All right. Blue boxes when we were in this time were legendary, but kind of like we couldn't really execute them anymore. They didn't do anything. But the TGI Fridays down the street, the one out down here, you guys familiar with that TGI Fridays? Anybody go to it while they stopped here yet? If not, you know, maybe go to it. In back then, red boxable. It was really awesome. And so, you know, when you had your red box, you're like, check it out. And I remember a guy, a phone freak friend of mine named Lucky, who'd be here. I think I met him or here. And we'd go, and you're like, check it out. It's actually a Cococks. So we can actually, you know, red box this thing. It was kind of cool because, you know, to see that in action at that time was fun. But in the hacker climate, who were we? We were mostly introverts, mostly. Um, we were enigmatic to a lot of people. Uh, helpful. I think all, all of us underneath of this has always been like, we just want to help others. Uh, you know, even if it means that we got on the wrong side of the law for a little bit of that, and I don't think we're like, ha, 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 I'm evil. I think it literally was like, whoops, <laughs> whoops, my impulse got to me again, <laughs> whoops, you know. A uh, bit mischievous, we like to prank people, it's fun. This is why I like Real Genius. Uh, and we were a little bit feared, you know. 9-11 happens, I know that's extreme, but now everything is security. National security. You know, and it was like literally like, you know, and, and, and we just had this fear. And it was like the rest of us was like, oh, crap. Did you read the Patriot Act? Did you read the Patriot Act? Right? Like, so. Um, but internally, our climate was to have certain goals. And I think we can all share these. Improve security. You know, we literally, for some reason, find security as a, well, I was told by a psychologist once, we all love security because we're insecure, which I actually kind of believe in a little bit. So, But, uh, but we want to improve security, whether it's internal or external. Um, <laughs> We want to learn. And that was the thing that I loved about TorCon. I just came here and I'm like, give me data, right? I mean, just learn so much. And we want to share. And you'd think it was the e most egotistical day of your, your, of your weekend was that, oh, man, I really talked a lot about myself. But you realize you're just excited about sharing what you've been working on. And then you go back home and you're quiet again and, you know, back to your normal life and back to being an introvert. No one understands me for until next year. You know, I can't wait till next year. I'll get understood again. Right? <laughs> and the conferences we had, obviously, were just DEF CON and 2600. So TourCon played a different role. And I think that's actually important. But how many people had this toy back then, 1999, and they're, they're, they're cool? If they were cool, they had this, right? The M100 or 101, right? And they actually kept a schedule. What hacker keeps schedules? Seriously. Sleep schedule, daytime, right? <laughs> you know? Uh, this was IoT. <laughs> You know, Quotron, anybody recognize this little device over here? You know what this talk's really about? We're fucking old. Anyways, and then uh, I've got a game for you guys today. All right, since we, most of us are more in my age group or higher and stuff, how many newbies, any first-time comers to TourCon this year? We got one over here. We got there, we got over there. Okay, we got a good crowd over here. This is great. How do you guys feel? Yep, thumbs up. Use sign language. I don't, I don't know. What? No. Also, I, I do have an idea, though. So when you go to the parties tonight or tomorrow, you're going to realize your voice is going to run out. I suggest next year, you, everybody learning sign language in a group. 
so that you can communicate and talk to each other while there's hardcore music going on because really you're going to want to talk even though there's music going on. And you're like, I'm at work. And that's what happens for like the next two weeks. So I say we do that, plus there's a good side effect. We can talk to deaf people and they're not upset about it. So, okay. Game time. Name that terminal. All right, I, I give you a, a freebie one. So, you guys ready? Which terminal does this computer match? Come on. Really? Thank you. Woo! Who said that? What's your name? Todd. Todd wins the trash. Hey, kidding. I don't, didn't bring those with me. <laughs> yes. That would have been fun, though. I'm like, I'll send you a trash 80, buddy. <laughs> All right. I, so would I, actually. <laughs> okay. I actually had someone send me their Commodore 64. I was, like, really stuck. Speaking of, I think you guys know this one, and it's hard to see, but which one is this? Yeah, it does say that, doesn't it? I was like, I could just cross it off, but you know what? Okay, someone describe it for me. What's it look like? It looks like that thing. Basically, big-ass computer, you find your own monitor. Thank you. Okay, and my favorite one. Uh, let's see if this worked. Hold on, come on, come on. Okay, wait. This one. Yes. This one. <sighs> I love this one. You know why? I don't know why. But this is the one I grew up on. And this is cool, except mine was a color monitor. I'll show you in just a second. So how many had the Apple IIe or two? Okay. How many had the Trash 80? Probably in schools. Most people didn't buy them. They were in their school, and you're like, hey, it's in school, the red button. Remember the little red button? How many had the Commodore? I think it's like, like an even round here, you know? It was really the battle of the computers back then, right? So all right. How many had none of them? How many had none of them, you youngers? Look at you, first timers. All right, so the cool thing about that, though, terminal stuff, was the fact that when you wanted to know a computer back then, you had to learn how to program. That was the user manual, the programmer's manual. Today, it's like, let me watch, <laughs> let's watch a show and press a button. We got Connor over here. He's gonna learn programming later, probably, but not because he has to. <laughs> so. All right, so I got a cool thing. I'm gonna go back a little nostalgia. My mom has her awesome moments, not all the time at all, but um, my mom has her awesome moments. I have two things that I love. I love music and I love computers. And my mom sent me actually recently all my classical music and stuff because I'm gonna pick up my violin again and do some stuff, but she sent me my Apple IIe from a childhood. This is really, really, really cool. And guess what's cool? It's not a, they took very care, good care of it. They the, gave me all the floppies. For some reason, all the games I had was pirated. I don't know about my parents right now. But I don't have an original game, except for who is, where in the world is Carmen Sandiego, because you had to buy that one because they did know how to do some DRM. So, but basically what I've got here is this is my first computer program I was like, that mattered to me that I wrote when I was eight. Story is, I read the computer programmer manual and I learned about X and Y plotting in BASIC, Apple BASIC, which is moving the mouse and the joystick. And I had the square little joystick. And so I, as a kid, was probably destined for security because I played games in my head as such a spy detective and I wanted to protect people. Likely because I'm adopted it too and it has some kind of weird psychological syndrome that goes with protecting people. But the point is, for my head, I'm the kid that's like, I'm gonna be an FBI agent and I'm gonna make sure everybody's safe crap, right? No, not the FBI agent that you hate. I meant just as a kid, okay? So I work for EFF, it's a badge, everybody. We're effing here, okay? No. Uh, <laughs> So uh, basically, in my head, I always wanted to protect people, right? And that, that, that was my thing as a kid. So I protected my games even, the run hello mode. He's got a thing going on with this one. <laughs> All right, so here is actually a startup. I found my first big program, and it's really cool. It might be hard to see, but I'm going to explain it. So I start this thing up. Yes, the floppy disks actually work. I enter a security code. This uses get car, which means it doesn't show any like stars or anything. The only vulnerability is that you could technically it has no enter either. So if you get the password right, it just opens up. Now this number right here is me taking my joystick and using it as a combination lock. So basically what it does is you have to know the actual number and the position in the joystick that you actually have to put in there to open up and get to the welcome to the president's own back door. I just made shit up when I was a kid. I don't understand it, but <laughs> so. I had to actually like, review the code so that I knew what the numbers were and the passwords were. I was like, okay, shit, I don't remember. So, so, and then I can't see what that is, but it's something probably just as you know, kid-like. You know. 
blah, 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 blah. So basically, I have to turn it one way, turn the, the combination the other way, and then I have an allot code. I don't know why I chose Jamaica, but for some reason, I chose Jamaica. Maybe geography class, I don't know. Maybe a cool word to spell. And then, boom, I'm in. So my joystick was a combination lock. It's like dance, dance, authentication, but different, right? So, <laughs> right, so basically, I could then start that. I actually edited me running Dig Dug on YouTube because it is a pirated copy of Dig Dug because of my parents. I don't know what the heck that's about. Anyways, that was my first hackathon at eight years old, writing some code, and I still have it. I'm really stoked about that. So anyways, all right, we're going to go back to normal stuff now, but I, you know, hey. Does anybody have all that? What Do they remember their first hack, their very first feeling of this? How many people still remember that? I know we're old and they're getting senile, but all right, cool. How many haven't even done their first hack yet and they're here and they're going, okay, I got to do it, man. I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step in there. I'm going to go. I was just going to get over it, man. I'm going to pop that cherry. So, no? How many? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Oh, Beetle, shut the fuck up. <laughs> He's still waiting for his first hack. People just don't acknowledge it yet. <laughs> Okay, mainstream view, 1999, 2001. Games are over, let's stop playing games, guys. Okay, there's your fucking movie. There's your fucking movie. All right, the movie messaging of what we were was basically 1999, 2001. We liked sneakers, the rest of the world thought of us as these hackers. And they, they tried, Sony really did try, to make us look like we're like, we're hacking the system, man. It's cool, man. This is how we talk to hack the planet all day long. That's how we do it. And, uh, you know, we use the most amazing GUIs. <laughs> you know, they really, they just, everything we do do, they got off. They just, you know, it was like wrong. And I get it. It's hard to do like good computer interesting stuff, but sneakers did a pretty good job. I honestly like the little, blah, 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 everything's un unencrypted. And guess what's cool? It's the actual crypto scene, and that was written by Rivests. So when he was talking about number field civs, they weren't bullshitting. <laughs> it was kind of cool. So, um, so Hackers was our freaking movie that everybody goes, so you're not going to hack my computer, are you, when you fix my email? No. But that's like saying, you know, you're not going to steal my car when I hand you my keys of LA. Dick. Anyways, so <laughs> Swordfish. Remember that one? I think it was 400 and, I think it was 412-bit encryption or something that you had to break with your gun at your, your head. And I'm like, I don't think anybody did the, 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 the numbers by 412. There was a 448, and that was one time that was Blowfish, OK? Uh, but 412, good luck. You know, I don't know if they were truncating for a reason. But if it is definitely a symmetric encryption, it's already broken anyway, so you just go get the tool. Um, antitrust, another one of those. This is, this is the movies that the mainstream saw, and this is what represented us. <sighs> I wish we were that good looking. Anyways, culture. <clears throat> By this time, we were 100% feared. We were still trying to figure out if we could get jobs, even in the dot-com bubble, right? We were, you know, we were probably sysadmins and stuff, kind of secretly going, man, I could take this place out. No, I'm just kidding. No, but, <laughs> but we were sysadmins, but we didn't get the job we loved. We wanted to work in security. We, we, you know, some of us may be lucky, but most of us had to figure out, let's just start a boutique. You know, let's just start my own thing. Let's start a thing, TourCon, right? Um, you know, we're feared. We must break the law. Even if, you know, we've never broken the law, all of us must break it. You know, that whole, like, 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of people did it, and so 80%. It's like that whole, like, I'm going to ban gloves because, you know, a few people killed people with gloves. But, you know, I use it to keep my hands warm in New York. So, and then, you know, you have, like, you know, obviously you did have stories of, Laws breaking, Robert Morris, all the other stuff that's going on. And most of the time, I'm going to joke about Sammy later, don't worry about it. Uh, but, you know, most of the time it wasn't like, I'm a bad guy. It was like, literally, oops, shit, my code is wrong. Right? You know what I mean? So, um, but we got the don't hack me, bro. Don't hack me, bro. Please don't hack me. Right? And, and we were associated mostly when we think hackers with viruses, you know, because we hacked the Gibson with those. <laughs> Ironic part is later how you get in most systems is with a virus, you know, so so the in tour com impact to San Diego How I looked at it was it was a voice now. It's very different. This is definitely not tour con We're so much better. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. no, no, <laughs> but basically this is definitely not tour con It's like tour con's like the big party, right? This is like, you know, this is mostly representative San Diego But also a lot of people come around and, and come here one for the weather um, and then two, I don't know if this time the weather, but two, 
you know, this is a conference that actually had streamlined, had focus, had like things that we wanted to do, and there wasn't this, um, I'd say, like I always try to say, leave, leave your ego at the login prompt. I have never been to this conference feeling like someone had an ego, which was really, really nice. Now, I'm sure we all do. I definitely have one once in a while, you know, ebbs and flows, things like that. Like I said, security, insecurity. But in the general sense, you can go to DEF CON and within two minutes, you're just like, oh shit, I do not want to talk to you. So, you know, and that's like, that's kind of happens. Here, I, I, I haven't really had that problem. And when I have upset people, they're just straight with me, right? Um, but you could share, you could share at TourCon, you could, you, you, there was an inspiration in the air, there was, there was things that got me excited. Now I'm obviously easily excitable, I'm dramatic, I get that, can't wait till I get old so I can, you know, fall and get attention. But, um, so basically, you know, but, uh, I stole that joke, it's fine. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyways, but basically TourCon wasn't DEF CON or 2600, it wasn't about if you did need validation, that's not what you were trying to do here in that way. You weren't trying to prove yourself in this like, like messed up, you know, mentally ill way of like, hey, look at me and I'm cool and like da da. -da. It was more like, whoa, you, you, everybody kind of sw swallowed their ego, and we're coming in like kind of a little hesitant at first, but then like, you know, hey, we've got some cool things. Hey, do you want to solder? I'll teach you. You know what? I still have never soldered. Twenty years later, I'm going to learn to solder this weekend. I am going to. I'm going to learn to solder. You know, this, this year actually for me is like 20 years as an adult in this industry. Yes, I'm old. Shut up. Looking good though. No, but so I actually went and got, I was in Hawaii. I actually saw David and Tim uh, in Hawaii and, and Avell. <laughs> and I ended up getting myself a tattoo. And the tattoo actually specifically, and this is why this is important to me, is, is the tattoo was an inspiration of everybody's like at this point, oh, Lance James, you're an expert, da 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 Which not by even the closest mile, but here it says beginner. So today, I come back to TourCon and I, I feel like this impact is still with me. I was listening to the reception last night and the world around us has definitely changed in the culture of hackers and stuff. But what I did have was I, I still listened and I still learned last night. I still heard and things that I've never heard before and, I've, and I saw the same excitement I saw the first time I got here. Um, I saw him being just as cool as he always has. I don't know, you know, he's also just looking young just like he always has, son of a bitch. No. Anyways. <laughs> But, you know, we had a good vibe. There's SoCal, right? Hikari definitely represents that, you know, hey. So, uh, but it's really about disruption and innovation. I sat on the floor with, I think, Anton Rager back my first one, like learning about VPNs, IPsec, ISACAMP, and he let me just jive into code with him. And I, I'm totally insecure about this and not even sure I can do it. Or, but he didn't question that. He just, you know, he believed in me the minute I got there. David believed in me the minute I got there. I believed in others the minute I got there. Uh, you were accepted. Your ego was not here. It was like, it was, there was an ego boost. You felt good. You didn't want to leave, that's for sure. Maybe it was my marriage, I'm not sure. No, I'm just kidding. No, you just didn't want to leave, you know, but, uh, you know. Um, and then we got Turcon 2001 to 2003 for me. I found my pattern. Check this out. Okay. So I attended September 2001, right? And this is for me. I'm feeling accepted and feeling inspired, excited. It's 2001, September. O October. I started an open source project, now called I2P, but back then called IIP. My language of choice at the time was C. So basically, I left TourCon excited and wanted to do something so I could speak at TourCon 2002, right? And literally, I just felt like, not just about the speaking, but obviously, I just felt really inspired. I left there going, okay, this is how it works. We contribute. We do something cool. So now, uh, my first panel was, I think, uh, utilizing invisibility and anonymity to protect security. It was my first time talking anywhere. And yes, even though I'm an extrovert and it seems natural, holy shit, you know, that was, yeah. Anyways, um, so, but basically after that, I did that talk. In 2003, after that, 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 uh, that tour con, I said, I'm going to do more. I'm going to start a San Diego security firm, right? And every year I would go, this is like, this was my spot. I didn't go to DEF CON for actually till 2004, five, right? This was my thing right here, you know? Uh, and so when I looked at what TourCon did for me, as much as it seems like I'm confident and extroverted now, there's, there's levels of that. There's a lot of stupid things as an extrovert you can do and stuff and put your foot in your mouth 100% half the time, all the time. And so, but when I look at it now and I go and look at the things that I have been able to do and have for myself and I look at everybody else and where they've gone and all these things, I see that TourCon has offered confidence it, 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 it said, you know, risks are to be taken. There wasn't that fear built into this room. Uh, it was make your voice known. I'm going to do a talk next year, right? And it got you past the first one where you humiliate yourself on purpose, 
which I think everybody just needs to get past, and then that fear kind of goes away, and you're just like, okay, well, they're not going to kill me, right? Uh, you know, and it also said, do what you believe in. Because, you know, when I started IIP, I2P thing, Ikari next year is like, yeah, Lance is doing this really cool thing, right? And then I get introduced to other people that are doing cool things in crypto, or, you know, and he would network us all together, right? And it built, you know, a bigger dev force, and it built, you know, people I could talk to and learn things. I also remember when I accidentally did an RM RF on Hikari's box by one time. I don't know why I did that. It was literally an impulsive, extroverted problem. Uh, <laughs> It was not passive aggressiveness, I swear to God. It was just me being so completely stupid. Anyways, um, so there's also mistakes that happen. You know what he goes? It, it's cool. It, it's cool. <laughs> Backups! Well, <laughs> but it changed the game. And one of the biggest things that taught me was to give back, right? Whether it's forward or not, right? And uh, so that, that's that. Now, I know that Trump doesn't believe in climate change, but... There is some hacker climate change. 1999, 2002, security warnings galore. You know, we're in that mode of like, guys, listen to us. And of course, we're not being listened to yet. We might get a couple of media hits here and there, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's like, you know, but we're just tinkerers, hackers. And what, what people were afraid of was us, not the actual like problems we were talking about. That wasn't going to be us doing them. And they didn't get that. They All they saw is, should I be suing you right now or putting you in jail because you told me something that I don't want to listen to? And that's what, that's what our climate was at that time. I, I would go try to talk to banks and say, here's this going on. And I'd, I'd find out banks, they're like, ordered, do not talk to Lance. You know, <laughs> literally, I'd find this out many years later. Don't, don't talk to Lance. He's got some stuff you don't want to hear about. Right? And, and I did it in a very professional way. Everything like, it wasn't like, you know, publicized it or anything like this. But this, is th this was the climate back then. We don't want to know about that stuff. Right? Uh, and we were always talking about what could be. The scale and mass hacking attacks, things like that. And I'm not talking the stupid Pearl Harbor crap. But just imagine an onslaught of, I don't know, people just hacking into your systems and you're getting breached all year and all these things are happening and oh my gosh, the OPM and all these things, other things that could happen. But, you know, they wouldn't or anything. Um, 2003, I think reality sets in. Emerging, I think the term became cybercrime. Right? We got targeted foreign attacks. Not even just targeted attacks. Guess who the, the guys who should be feared are? Not us. It was, you know, you know, hello, Mr. Hacker. I've got some pests in my election. Can you help me? You know? <laughs> so, uh, so basically, a reality set in. Uh, cybercrime gets hooked, you know, like a big hit. Uh, you know, we got foreign attacks. There's a thing called phishing that we've heard about since at least 1996 or more. But, you know, suddenly this is like now a thing that someone's got to write a book on and tell the rest of the people of the world about, right? So we got malware, malicious software, what we used to call viruses. But now we've got targeted malware. It's not like it just came on the scene. It's just now everybody knew about it. So we had kind of this whole big I told you freaking so moment, but we didn't get to ever say it yet. So, so we set the stage. Now it's good versus evil because everybody's got to have a bad guy, right? You know, hackers need to, you know, fight the wars for everybody else, right? So we got, you know, we suddenly have jobs for hacker communities, mostly blue team stuff, but it's a start, right? We got, you know, the invention of, uh, you know, this reactivity causes this explosive industry growth that starts hitting from 2003 and beyond, the invention of what's called threat intelligence, right? And we have all of this stuff, and we have these disruptive effects because of this explosion, such as things like Tor and Freenet were already kind of moving, but now it's like privacy and anonymity is even a bigger issue. Right? And these things kind of continue ahead. Um, so what we termed as hacktivism back then was someone like me. I actually wrote software for privacy reasons. Now we, it's a bunch of dicks with computers that DDoS people because they want to play a video game or not play a video game. I don't know. Um, and then when, you know, the cool thing is that I2P tour all of these things. They, they, they started getting government interest you know, as much as EFF interest, F and A. So um, you know, when we look at that, you know, peer-to-peer -peer was a kind of a thing that was starting to really kind of kick out. Now, obviously, we look at it today and Bitcoin. So, uh, but, you know, we also had the file-sharing wars at that time. That was a fun one, right? Anybody ever get, like, a letter? I got a letter twice or three times. I think it was, what movie was it? Secret Window? That one was one. You know how I got out of that, though? Yeah, I run a security firm, and I have a honey net set up at my house, and we didn't know that distribution was on. Sorry. Cool. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. All right, don't, you can only do that move once, though. Just saying, just saying. <laughs> I learned real quick. All right, my <laughs> so uh, we had DRM, which was basically fear versus innovation. And of course, I think we all know the basic 
gist of the story is Apple iTunes kind of cha changed the game and made the vehicle. If you want to get into detail or debate of who did that really, but basically, you know, we went through all of these things, right? So, and now we have these things called APT or advanced persistent marketing. I mean, advanced persistent threat. Um, it's a human oriented targeting concept, AKA it's spies learned how to use computers, right? Uh, and it's a shift in thinking. It's this agile, like look at us as castles and guess what's happened is the invention of gunpowder just came out and now shit, all our castles are falling, right? And so hackers and intelligence communities suddenly become closer. Yes, I became friends with some of the FBI guys because they just were helpless and I felt bad. I actually did. I was like, oh, you guys need help. You guys need help. I can make money here. Okay, you can, you can, you can, you can I'll help you. So, <laughs> and our new competition arrives. A lot of people want to call them adversaries. I call them competition, right? One, the reason why I also wanted to help wasn't really just about the money. It was like, oh, hell no. You're not going to make it out like all hackers are bad guys. We are not going to give them a bad name. I am going to go after these son of a bitches right now. So basically, here is the new business that gets on the market, which is no different than a structure of normal business, because that's what it is. This is a full-on operation, malware operation, swift operation, any of those heists that you see, this is that system. This is crimeware as a service. You know, so we got this new shift, 2003 to now. How did it get so exponential? Well, forums, right? And then you've got like some kingpin or enterprise guy that doesn't even know how to code. And he goes, you know, I got a really cool idea. Let's rob some banks, right? Let's do American ones because, you know, we don't like them because, you know, hey, Cold War and all. So then basically what will happen is they'll recruit a developer within a form. They'll develop that. Uh, they'll produce a product for the enterprise recruiter there and then realize, I don't have an NDA. I think I'll just switch my handle. I'm going to make a new product and done. And then that person basically goes in the same cycle, makes a product for himself, becomes an enterprise, gets rich, and then pays other people to do the same thing. And this whole thing has become an exponential problem. The division of labor lowers uh, and basically it's not even like the skills we have. It's that these tools are just out there now, right? And I think we all know that. And it's like, that really makes a bad name for us, right? So, uh, and so now suddenly the defense isn't firewalls. I've been walking through your firewall. It's different. It's information sharing. Right now, we've talked about this. We're like, information sharing, what are you talking about? Right? But now the view has been that because we have this new unorthodox community that's formed, which includes industry, hackers, law enforcement, and intelligence communities, we're starting to learn this new tradecraft about information sharing. So when I was in 2003, I would talk to ISPs and say, you got some shit. Can I get your hard drive? I'll give you a free report. And I would learn about phishing and these Russians and all these cool, fun things. Uh, and literally it was about this whole like communication of like this because criminals they share this information We don't have NDAs to protect, you know, they just do it And so we were like exponentially just going okay. This is gonna have to be a thing We're gonna have to share information which is still by the way a very difficult problem for some reason even though we're here at TorCon and always share information Just saying all right, so we were kind of used to that So now it's like infosec and this is how it goes. It meets the tradecraft of intelligence Right? And then we get this whole thing where it's like, now we have to like learn these things, by the way. And half the time we're faking it, we're just like, all right, let me go look that stuff up real quick. Okay, I was kind of gonna just do some exploits, but fine, I'll learn about the CIA model and the Lockheed chain of cut, you know, all this stuff. So basically the whole thing now is InfoSec defense is we have to learn their adversaries or operational framework. It goes back to the human again. It's not bits and bytes. People aren't gonna actually be chasing that. We can patch all day, everything like that. Obviously, we know that. Right, and so now it's all these like, let's find some predictive insights and detection. And so we have this mix now. And guess what, Katie Masaurus I think nailed it, but you know, war games was a neat thing, because you know, when we looked at that, that's what caused Reagan to actually react and create the Anti-Fraud and Abuse Act, Title 18, 1030, so that you know, we can be afraid. Now, then today, we've got articles such as Not All Hackers Are Evil by Katie Masaurus, which is awesome by the way, she's awesome by the way. She changed the game by making us friendly, by building bug bounty concepts so that we'd have escrow systems to get along. You remember when the companies would just fear us if we, hey, you got a vulnerability. Sorry, you're under arrest, sir. Right? Did happen to me once, right? Okay, and so basically, uh, and, and uh, she changed that and built this escrow concept of saying, here's cooperative game theory. We're gonna make it so that you get the problem that you want solved and your risks are lowered and the hackers will stay away from you but they'll also hack you. It's going to be great, and it is, and that's what's really, really cool is it took some creativity to, to, for us to adapt in this new world, this, this world where everybody's still afraid. Um, 
You know, our job is to, to, to hunt hackers, fight your wars for you, uh, you know, things like that. You know, get those Russians out of people's elections, you know, stuff like that. Like, that's our job these days, right? To hunt hackers. So we have to hunt other hackers. Good news, you're all here. Just kidding. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> and then there's this thing called attribution. And so people have gotten used to, we're used to IPs, hashes, SHAs, all, you know, domains, things like this. And then there's this new art form that then we have to suddenly go, this is what we're looking for. Motivation, objective, timeliness, resources, risk tolerance. So we now have to study and learn human psychology, all these other things that go with our play. Which I think we already knew that psychology was a big play into security anyways. But this is that. But yet you know, we don't really call it that. <clears throat> this is our target. But what they call attribution is like North Korea, China, you know, when it, at first you don't succeed, just blame China, that kind of thing, right? So uh, I stole that joke too. That's Mike Kern. Um, but basically, you know, what happened? What was different? What, what's going on here? So yesterday's youth, we had, how many people had a 300 bot? I don't know if we, wow, you guys are really old. Cool. So, <laughs> okay, how about a 14.4? Who started on 14.4s? All right, 1,200. Anybody start on a 1,200? All right, do we have 1,200? Do we have a 33.6? Do we have a 33.6, everybody? All right, so 33.6. Uh, I started, I think, on a, a 1,200 at one point, and then I got over to, because I didn't have a modem on my Apple IIe. Bastards. But, you know, hey. Um, but anyways, remember when we had to wait for every little bit and bite, and every bit was cherished. Literally like, okay, I'm waiting for this BBS to start. But, 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 right? Like, you know, uh, we don't have that anymore, right? There's this long game incentive. We're like, crap, we have, a, we have to write code to, to get this thing to work. You know, I wrote code just to dial on my modem, right? Like, it's like you really had to do this. And then today, tomorrow's youth, uh, you know, access is what it is in a good way, right? Except that there's a lot of not understanding. They think Ruby's a good idea. So, um, you know, and then there's the barrier to entry to anyone, which I do love. For instance, there are a lot more women here, and I'm really thankful and happy of the diversity here. And that is awesome. Because it wasn't like we were pushing anybody out. It was just, you know, we were just kind of a bunch of dudes like trying to figure stuff out. But we're seeing those barriers to entry. Everybody has access to the same information. Even if you're almost broke, you can get a smartphone for 20 bucks and get on the internet and learn some stuff, right? And you can. So there's not this, this the depletion of class systems anymore to succeed in that way. It is kind of causing an equilibrium. It's also probably causing what all the weird shit in our, com our world is today. But so what? <laughs> you know, take out the middleman, see how it goes. Um, and but, but we're driven by short-term driven incentives. When you see a hacker today, it's about internet fame and in ego and if I can, you know, swat you or, you know, DDoS you and I'm cool and you really just don't appreciate, you know, I dare you to write that code. Anyways, um, so we got security media then and now. Back then, TourCon 1 was needed. No one was listening when hackers yelled. You know, we we're kind of like a movement, but didn't know it yet. Uh, gray hat approach. Look what I found. You're stupid. You're vulnerable. How many people know this one? I did this. I had a whole Twitter thing of this. Yeah. You know, look at you. You're dumb. Uh, you know, and I'm slightly famous for a day. And that's the reality for us is we got our ego trip. We found our vulnerability. We tried to let them know because we felt like they weren't listening. And it was true. That was kind of the vibe. And then today, um, you know, the media shifts. There's APT1 report comes out and makes a billion dollars. You know, they swear it was for the good of the country. But, you know, then cyber goes mainstream. You know, cyber, cyber. Right? You know that was originally designed from refers to sex, right? Hey, you want a cyber? Right? So, uh, <laughs> ASL, baby. <laughs> you know, and then uh, security, uh, research, and marketing find they become friends. Sometimes you're like, I think I sold my soul to marketing. Right? How many people feel like that sometimes? We definitely do. We're like, oh, I think I sold my soul to marketing. But, but we did find a home together. They know how to push what we're doing in our security research, which is powerful because that's their area. They, it's PR for us. Yay, we're all famous. Um, but it actually has helped. Uh, I don't agree with the APT1 report in the sense of like the, the approach because that was like bone crash and you know whatever. But uh, it shifted for us. And in a way, it's kind of like, all right, now we all have jobs. We all have ways to do this. Heck, you can't hire enough security people. There's a gap now because of the fact that not enough people know what we know. And then we look at the evolution of targeted attacks, which is basically I started, and I was wrong in my first book. I wrote a phishing exposed book. And I was like Mr. Fishing Guy, expert dude. And I was wrong. I was like, I literally didn't think spear phishing was going to be a big deal. <laughs> and so I, I look back and I'm like, oops. I hope they don't read that line. So, uh, <laughs> but basically, you know, we go from serial campaigns, which is like, uh, you know, 
you guys remember the PayPal, the ones that just come in your box all the time in the, ba the Bank of America? I swear I'm, I swear of Bank of America. I swear, just log in, go ahead, right? Uh, and so they would hit all the customers in serial mass, which is tiring, even if you have to just press buttons to do it. But like, it's tiring. Your finger gets tired, and you're just like, okay, I gotta do this another two weeks and run another campaign, no, do this. But what changed was then they also realized, wait, we can hop over the fence. And we'll just target inside the targets of the world, literally target, target. <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, and we get target, we get all that, and everything changed. How many people have a chip now in your wallet with uh, the, the thing, right? Almost every single person. Who doesn't have a chip in here? Get the, f no. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Krebs, for putting that out there. I know that, you know, basically, but basically the target hack kind of changed the game and find us, finally got us caught up with the UK and have a chip, even though they've been doing it for almost 10, 15 years. So basically, organized crime and, and all of this stuff, when we heard about, like, back then, I could actually track organized crime. I could tell the difference between a nation state. I could do that. Now I can't, right? Nation states always did the precise, hit them on the other side. That's why I was like, spear fishing ain't going to be a big thing. It's going to be a few people. It's going to be governments, and they're going to do their thing, and you're not going to hear about it. Well, obviously, we did. Um, but, you know, an advanced persistent marketing threat is, you know, any of these things today, right? So y you can't tell really the difference. They're all using the same tools, right? So the evolution is different now. And we've gone from back orifice. How many, please tell me you remember that one. How many people like messed with people and like did the whole like Darth Vader plus CD-ROM opening at the same time thing where it's like and then it's like every time it goes out, the sound's making a Darth Vader thing. I really want, I love doing that to people. Just scan the internet and just do you know, and it was just like, you know, it was great. Um, so from back orifice, everybody, you know, you, you have to admit some of us, you scan and you just mess with people's computers. Come on. Come on, we all did it. You know, it's, it's almost impossible not to. Um, so B.O. comes out, right? Scares the crap out of people. Greatest name in the world is Kell to the Dead Cow, right? And then now we have basically DVRs. It's like, it's like we have Mirai. You guys took any of you at the seminars yesterday, the disrupting Mirai, things like that. Okay, so we are gonna, I'm going to brag. Flashpoint was the one who got the name and figured out who that was. But it was really not even Flashpoint. It was Allison Nixon. She's kind of awesome. So, um, but it, you know, I remember the news, and it was like everybody's like, is it Russia? Is it China? Right? I'm like, it's not China. You know? and, it, and, and, and so it was like that. It was basically, it's not Russia. Wait, hold on. That's right. Hold on. Teenagers with your TV. In Vietnam, mostly, basically. But basically, it's a bunch of 2004 DVRs that have, uh, you're going to love this, <laughs> Telnet. Telnet's open. It's default. And if you actually even reboot the router after you've changed the password, guess what happens? It goes back to default. And you're sitting there going, I thought we fixed this. But apparently now we have problems like we think about like recall issues or like, oh, well, what if a manufacturer just decides to do it their own way? And now we have to worry about those problems. But isn't it funny that, you know, we can talk about 1999 Tourcon 1, we can talk about today, and this vulnerability would have been, <laughs> it's, it's, this is a Tourcon 1 vulnerability, people. So the only thing is, is that the internet is a lot more, has more targets. So we're literally half the internet, when I say that, it really means just half your TV shows that you wanted to watch went offline. Um, <laughs> You know, so basically this is, that's what happened. It's basically Telnet, scan the world of Telnet machines, infect them, drop something in there until it reboots, and basically you can DDoS the world. And we thought it was Russia, and it's teenagers with like super, super, you know, like high speed DDoS, which is kind of cool. And the reason they did it was they were upset about a video game. Seriously, they were trying to target a video game company. It didn't work, so they went after freaking the, the um, what do you call it, the DNS provider. Boom, whoops, right? And I'm sure it was a whoops, <laughs> so. So, testing one, two, three. Microphone is now on. We're here, night, TourCon 19, right? And I'm probably going to go over by like two minutes, but don't hate me. So, um, but microphone, it's your fault anyways. You guys were late. <laughs> no, <it's yeah. laughs> Hackers are now Hollywood, man. Mr. Robot, all that fun stuff. I've, I've gotten to be on the news a lot. It's like cool, and I don't feel afraid. I mean, they still get the jokes like, we're just going to call you the brain on blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, all right, <laughs> don't hack my computer. Right, you know, that kind of stuff. I love, I love that. I still get those. I'm, you know, I'm starting to try to do talks on like, hey, you know, stop saying that. It's really annoying. Um, the question is, are we responsible? Now that the microphone is on, this, is this on? You know, uh, we still do a lot of stunt work. You know, I hacked your car, phone, TV, and I think that's fine. I'm not saying I'm judging anybody or, or anything. Like, Charlie Miller is actually a really talented dude, and that is awesome to know about. Do we not, you know, I, I, ha, I, I mentor a lot of kids now, and they're like, dude, I just like got it where I played the speaker on someone's hotel room next door. Cool, do you know how to fix that? Would you know how to actually fix that if you were the hotel manager and the CISO of the company and, you know, n n no. 
right? Right. So, so it's cool. We can do all those stunt works. There's tools. There's things like that. But the question is, is it solving problems? Are we actually solving the solutions in the long run? We can point out the vulnerabilities. That's fine. I think we got that, that, that clue real quick. It's, we're vulnerable now. We don't need anybody to tell us that. OPM, Target, JP Morgan. I mean, I think everybody's got that. Now we're like from the castles, you know, the gunpowder days, and now we're trying to go, okay, it's going to be painful for us adjusting to all this gunpowder, right? And we're in that painful time. We're in that painful time. Uh, there's also issues with ethical disclosure. You guys remember the concept of ethical disclosure, right? You know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And it was like big topics, but most people at least adhered to 30 days, you know? And, and, and now companies don't adhere to that. They just want to get their content out because it's king. It's money. It's bacon. Data is bacon, you know? New bacon, you know? And, and then that's the thing. I mean, content truly is currency today. Inf sneakers. Information is, it's all about the information. Well, he wasn't lying. Um, you know, and we see these secure by marketing approaches. You know, thanks. I'm, I really love that padlock. Thanks. I made it out of clay. Um, you know, seen a few of those. And then politics and hacking. Dice roll. Dice function roll. Uh, basically, political attribution, North Korea. And we want to rush to it. Like, you know, we know that North Korea hacked Sony, even though 23 people in the uh, last two years hacked Sony, and it's like the village bicycle, and everybody gets a ride on Sony. But, like, my point is, is how do you actually even know which hacker was what to what? And you ever heard of false flag concepts? Like, you know, you guys are supposed to be the military deciding this, right? So it's really, really funny because it's now just become this political tool. I'm literally watching a debate between who hacked Swift on two different regions, on d different sides of the West Coast between two different agencies. I'm like, they're literally fighting over, like, this person hacked. I'm like, I I've watched this, and I'm just like, okay, this is all politics. This is all pressure. This is just reactive pressure, you know? Um, and attribution to me is not a country. It's a person, you know? Hey, who, who actually put their fingers on that keyboard, right? So, so these are our things. Are we, are we being responsible? Are we keeping, you know, uh, what are we going to do about those pesky Russians? Um, last but not least, mainly because I promised Jeremiah Grossman I would f get him back by putting him in a, in, a, in a talk of mine. And so <laughs> this is also stolen from Mike Kern, but this is awesome. Uh, Rami, how many people watch Mr. Robot? How many people liked it? Keep your hands up if you did. Decent. Okay. More people liked it than watched it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> click theory. Anyways, um, <laughs> so I just thought this was funny. Robbie uh, acts like a hacker. You know, it was actually it's pretty good accurate, except for the first scene on the tour exit nodes where he's like, you know, you're running a child porn thing on this, like, you know, on the tour, but he's actually not, and you can't run a, your own service and go through exit nodes. It doesn't work that way. But, you know, I'm not going to correct you guys. But, like, it's fine. Uh, but, you know, and this is Jeremiah Grossman. We do think there's a slight resemblance, but, you know, more smiles from him. Uh, you know, but this, this show has also played a big influence. Uh, but I think what's more important um, is the, a special thanks uh, goes out to TourCon because we talk about influence. Uh, and for me, to, uh, you know, I want to just put out a big thanks to Dave, Tim, Gio, Carlos, Matrix, DJing tonight. That, that was new to me, actually. Uh, Beetle. No, I love you, bro. Uh, Riverside. Sammy, you're still my hero. Still, still, still my hero. I, I watch his work, and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's kind of the cool cat in the crew. He's like the cool guy. He's always pushing that. Uh, there's mom. She's literally been here from the, the first star. Please stand up, actually. You know what? She's been, no, you got to do it. Come on, come on, come on. She is literally supported as a mom. That's a mom right there, right? Okay. And so many others. Um, and you guys. You guys make this obviously happen. Um, I just wanted to thank, though, you guys for TourCon, especially for... Uh, it's a start for many, including the new people. Uh, it's an inspiration to, I think, all of us in any ways. We always try to see what we can come back with next year. It's a safe community, but I really just wanted to thank you for offering your home. And that's, I think, what it is for all of us as a home. Uh, and that's my speech. I don't think I have to ask for questions, which is kind of cool. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.